Hello, and welcome to Intermediate Financial Accounting 1, Tutorial 6. In this short tutorial, we will look at constructing a balance sheet, uh, also known as a Statement of Financial Position, or SFP, under IFRS. There are three learning objectives for this tutorial. The first will be to review the preparation of an IFRS Statement of Income. The second will be to describe the elements of a Statement of Financial Position and third, to prepare an IFRS Statement of Financial Position. This tutorial is based on the Walker Suites Inc. example. Please be sure to download the correct accompanying file so that you can follow along. Please review the background data and requirements before proceeding, so it is suggested that you pause the video at this point and then continue when you are ready. We will now proceed with Requirement 1, which is to prepare a Statement of Income for the five months ended May 31st, 2020. To review the preparation of a statement of income, of course we begin with a title. What I'm showing here are the various alternative titles that we could have. If we were preparing under ASPE, we would call this an income statement. If we are preparing under IFRS and OCI exists, and we're reporting via a single statement approach, then we would call this a statement of comprehensive income. If OCI does not exist, which is the case here, or if OCI exists and we're reporting using a dual statement approach, then we would simply call this a statement of income. And OCI does not exist in our example, so we will title this the statement of income. And remember that you need a period, so for the five months ended May 31st, 2020. Next, we begin our income statement with our sources of revenue. So here we have sales. And sales, in our example for Walker Suites Inc., is determined based on 22,770 in cash sales from the data provided, plus 5,320 in collections on accounts receivable, plus 4,226 on uncollected accounts receivable. Remember that when we revert to accrual accounting, we have to make sure that we recognize as revenue any and all sales, even though they have not been collected yet. Next, we include the cost of goods sold, totaling $12,686. And that's comprised of 14,400 in purchases, less a rebate of $130, plus outstanding accounts payable, again, thanks to accrual accounting. Even though we haven't paid it yet, we have to record it. Uh, and then minus our ending inventory, which would have been counted. Other questions would typically add a beginning uh, inventory uh, amount, but because WSI began operations in 2015, the beginning balance in inventory is zero. So please make sure you can reconcile these numbers from the data before proceeding. Once we've calculated sales and cost of goods sold, we calculate then gross profit of 19630 At this point, here's a good opportunity to review what we covered previously. Can you determine the type of income statement that we are preparing? If you answered a multi-step income statement, then you would be correct. Now we will list the operating expenses for WSI, beginning with advertising. Now this is a given number of 424 and we don't have to calculate it, so it makes it easy for us. Next we have depreciation, which is an amount that uh, has to be calculated. Recall that if we were reporting under ASPE, then the term depreciation would be replaced with amortization. Also, please ensure that you review the data so that you can identify where the numbers in this example are coming from. In order to calculate depreciation on a straight line basis, we have a formula that is cost minus residual divided by the useful life of the asset. The cost of the asset is $3,000. There is a zero residual value and the asset has an expected life of five years. And that will give us a depreciation rate of $600 per year. However, what we must do is make sure that we prorate to the nearest whole month. And so multiplying that by 5 over 12 gives us our $250. Also, it is very important to note that many students will want to use the half-year rule, which is only related uh, for taxation purposes in the calculation of capital cost allowance, or CCA. So unless the company has a stated policy of taking only one half year as depreciation in the year of acquisition, do not apply the half year rule. Then we have insurance expense calculated 
to be $1,920 less the prepaid amount of $1,120, resulting in actual insurance expense for the five months of $800. Then we have maintenance of $110, which is given, followed by rent of $1,500. Again, this is calculated as the cash paid of uh, $1,800 minus the prepaid amount of $300 at the end. Now, the $300 is based on $1,800 in cash for six months. So if we take $1,800 uh, divided by six months, that's $300 per month. And there's only one month remaining. So that's why we have that. Alternatively, this could be calculated as... 1800 divided by uh, six months times five months used and that will give us the same fifteen hundred dollars our salaries and wages is calculated to be five thousand seven hundred and forty and that's based on fifty five hundred dollars paid plus two hundred and forty dollars payable to employees at the end of the five month period finally we have our utilities expense totaling $4,270, and that's comprised of $4,000 paid in cash plus the $270 payable. So at this point, are you able to determine whether this multi-step income statement that we're doing here is prepared on the basis of nature or function? If you answered by nature, then you would be correct, as a statement does not break out expenses by business function, such as selling your administration. So this entire statement is by nature. Our next section would be other revenues and gains, which do not appear in this example, so we can go straight to other expenses and losses. Now, there are no losses in the WSI example, only interest expense, which has a little bit of a complex calculation. And as a reminder, IFRS uses the term finance expense, whereas ASPE uses the term interest expense. And so because we are preparing a, an IFRS, a statement of income, we want to make sure we use the correct term finance expense for this. In our example, there's a $312 payment made on April 1st for three months, and that's combined principal and interest on the loan. The data states that the loan balance at the beginning of the period was $2,880, and we know that the loan bears 10% interest. So if we take that 10% interest of $2,880 and then prorate it for three months, that gives us interest expense or finance expense of $72. So that's where this first piece comes from. So if we take our total blended principal payment minus the $72 in interest, that means that the amount of the principal in the first payment is $240. And then now at the end of May, even though no interest loan payment was made, we have to make sure that we accrue the interest expense for the first two months since the first payment. So as you can see here, what we did is we took the beginning balance of 2,880 and subtracted the 240 principal portion, leaving a new principal balance of $2,640. If we take that 2,640 times 10% and then prorate 2 over 12, that means the accrued interest for the two months is $44. And that's how we arrive at the additional $44 in this finance expense calculation. So the total finance expense or interest expense under ASPE is $116. After that, the rest is easy. We can calculate our income before taxes to be $6,420, which is our income from operations, minus our interest expense. And then based on a 20% tax rate that's given in the problem, we calculate our interest expense to be 1,284, resulting in net income of $5,136. And now we show a comparative of a completed statement of income under IFRS and a completed income statement under ASPE. Now, both of these are multi-step statements and they are presented by nature. So before proceeding to the second requirement, please make sure you're able to follow through this example with the data provided. So now that we have completed requirement one of this example, we will now proceed with requirement two, which is to prepare a statement of financial position as at May 31st, 2020. We begin our statement with the name of the company, Walker Suites, Inc. 
And then depending on whether or not we are following uh, ASPI or IFRS, that will determine the correct terminology next. So we can choose to use the term balance sheet, which is applicable actually to both ASPI and IFRS. And if we are reporting under IFRS, we may choose to use the term statement of financial position. In our example here, we have elected to prepare a statement of financial position because we are preparing this under ASPI. Uh, the other thing to note is that whereas the uh, statement of income or income statement and the retained earnings statement or statement of changes in equity cover a period, so we would say like for the five months ended uh, May 31st, the balance sheet or statement of financial position is a snapshot in time. And so the correct terminology is as at May 31st, 2020. So once we have our title, we proceed with the left side of our balance sheet for the asset side, and we have a section for current assets. In this example, we will be presenting all of the assets in order of liquidity, so from most liquid to least liquid. There is the opportunity or the alternative to present under reverse order of liquidity under IFRS, and we will discuss that in a future slide. Suffice it to say that we begin with cash, and the cash is calculated to be $2,134 as the cash collected minus the cash disbursements, which is provided from the original data. And then additional current assets in our example include accounts receivable of $4,226, inventory of $1,840, prepaid insurance of $1,120, and prepaid rent for $300. Total current assets, $9,620. Once again, before proceeding, please ensure that you are able to reconcile these numbers. Now for a little bit of theory. Current assets are defined as those that are realized within one year from the reporting date or operating cycle, whichever is longer. Now that said, it's very rare that you'll come across a company with an operating cycle that exceeds one year. As you can see from the table that's included here, this table should also be found in your course pack. There are a number of items that comprise current assets. We won't go through them all, but we'll touch on some of them. They can include cash and cash equivalents, short-term trading investments, accounts receivable, of course, notes receivable, supplies on hand, prepaids, etc. Notice that for all items, except future income tax, there is no difference in the treatment between ASPE and IFRS. The concept to defer taxes is beyond the scope of this course, so you will not need to calculate future and deferred income tax. However, you may need to know how it's properly presented based on the particular standard used. For ASPE, the current portion of future taxes is reported as current assets, whereas for IFRS, all deferred tax amounts are reported as long-term assets or liabilities, regardless of their orientation as being current or future. It may also be interesting to note that for ASPE, deferred taxes are referred to as future income tax, whereas IFRS refers to deferred taxes as deferred income tax. Before proceeding, make sure that you're comfortable with the concepts and review these, uh, these details carefully. Okay, so after current assets, we then have long-term assets. In this case, we have equipment valued at $3,000 less accumulated depreciation of the 250 that we had calculated previously. Of course, if this was an ASPE statement, then we would have accumulated amortization. In this case, our accumulated depreciation is the same as the depreciation expense because this is the first year of operation and there is no beginning amortization to start us off. So this gives us total long-term assets of $2,750 and therefore total assets of $12,370. So to review, non-current or long-term assets are those assets that are realized in greater than one year and or are employed to generate future ongoing revenues. If you think about it, really the only reason why a business invests in long-term assets is to be able to conduct business over the longer period or the long term. Now, whether that be computers and leasehold improvements to support a service business or equipment and factory to produce or manufacture products. Long-term assets can include investments in joint ventures, property, biological assets, of course, property, plant and equipment, intangible assets, and of course, deferred income tax. The values that investments in other long-term assets are carried at are discussed in later chapters, so be sure to familiarize yourself with the basics at this point. For example, certain type of investments are carried at amortized cost 
where others are carried at fair value. So if we look at investments here, we can have um, amortized cost investments held to maturity or available for sale that can go through IFRS uh, through comprehensive income. For the most part, the rules are very similar for both IFRS and ASPE, with the exception of investments and deferred uh, or future income taxes, as previously discussed. So we can now move on to the left side of the balance sheet, which focuses on liabilities and shareholders' equity. We begin with current liabilities, which consists of accounts payable of $526, salaries payable of $240, Income tax payable, as we had previously calculated, to be $1,284, the $44 of interest for the two months that we accrued, and the current portion of the bank loan, which is $240 times four payments. We simplified this calculation because otherwise each subsequent calculation of interest will result in lower interest amounts and higher principal amounts in a blended payment but the amounts for our illustration would be immaterial and negligible. So we just presume for simplicity's sake to use the same 240 principal payment times four payments. So our total current assets, $3,054. And again, to review some basic theory, current liabilities are those obligations that are due within one year from the reporting date or the operating cycle, so whichever is longer. And as you'll notice from the list, which is included in your text, that can include any bank indebtedness or overdraft, accounts payable, notes and loans, accrued liabilities, income taxes payable, and other items. The only difference between ASPE and IFRS is our good friend deferred income tax. Under ASPE, current portions are presented, whereas under IFRS, all deferred tax items are classified as long term. Before continuing, please make sure that you're able to reconcile the numbers that we have in the current liabilities and review examples of items that would be included in current liabilities for future examples. Next, we have long-term liabilities, which consists of the long-term portion of the bank loan. The total balance of the bank loan per our previous calculations is 2640 However, we have to uh, separate that between current and long-term portions as we identified earlier, and we can review the calculation to make sure that it all works. If we had the original $2,880 balance minus the 240 principal from the first payment gave us 2,640. And if we subtract 960, that will leave us with 1,680. So that's the current portion and this is the non-current or long-term portion. As defined, non-current or long-term liabilities are those obligations that are due in greater than one year. Reviewing the table from your text, long-term liabilities can be comprised of long-term debts, notes, bonds, capital or finance leases, employee pension benefits, and of course, deferred tax. And we can see uh, long-term portions of deferred tax under both IFRS and ASPE. And then we move on to our last section, which is shareholders' equity. The correct presentation in shareholders' equity is to begin with any contributed share capital. So we usually have a section called contributed capital. Sometimes you might see the term paid in capital. And our proper disclosure shows that in this case, we have only common shares and we have unlimited authorized shares and 1,000 shares issued and outstanding with a capital value of $2,500. In case you're wondering, Yes, the correct presentation is to disclose the number of shares outstanding. And in the case of more than one class of shares, you need to make sure that you have a title for contributed capital or paid in capital. If only one item exists, you can do without the contributed capital or paid in capital title and just have common shares. Contributed capital may also include some other items such as contributed surplus resulting from share related transactions, but those will be discussed in later chapters. And then following our common shares, we have retained earnings of $5,136. There are also a couple of additional items worth mentioning here. First is that the disclosure of the number of common shares that are authorized and then issued and outstanding can be disclosed either on the face of the balance sheet like it is here or in the notes to the financial statements. So as long as somewhere either on the face or in the notes these items are uh, disclosed then you're okay. Additionally 
you should always be able to prove the retained earnings balance. We didn't prepare a statement of retained earnings, a statement of changes in equity in this example. To recall, if we have the zero beginning retained earnings plus the 5,136 in net income less dividends of zero because none were declared, that leaves an ending balance of 5,136 in retained earnings. As defined, equity represents the company's net assets, which is equal to total assets minus total liabilities and represents the ownership interest in the firm. Shareholders' equity may consist of share capital, contributed surplus, of course, retained earnings or deficit in a negative position, other accumulated uh, comprehensive income or uh, AOCI. And this appears under IFRS only. We will not see AOCI under ASPE. Please take a moment to ensure that you can reconcile all of the shareholder equity amounts and review the background theory on shareholders' equity presented in the table and in your text before moving on so you are prepared for future examples and, of course, any exams. You may have also noticed that there is no accumulated other comprehensive income or AOCI in this other in this equity section as compared to previous tutorials and that's because in our example there is no OCI other comprehensive income on the income statement does not exist so there isn't uh, an accumulated OCI section on our balance sheet and thus we have a completed balance sheet that's acceptable under both ASPE and IFRS this represents a good opportunity for us to review the differences between how we can present under ASPE and IFRS. So recalling from earlier in the beginning of the tutorial, we said that we could call this a balance sheet and that would be acceptable under both ASPE and IFRS, or we could call it a statement of financial position under IFRS. We have also elected to present the assets in order of liquidity. So from most liquid to least liquid with cash being the most liquid and of course equipment being the least liquid. And liquidity is de simply defined as the ability to turn something into cash. So cash is the most liquid and equipment and other non-current assets are uh, the most difficult to turn into cash. And then on the liabilities and shareholders equity side, the liabilities section is presented in order that the liabilities come due. So from sooner, due sooner to due later. So accounts payable, trade payables are usually the ones that are due earliest. And of course, bank loan is, they can span a number of years or mortgages, which can span decades, obviously are the, uh, the latest due. And then the shareholders equity section as presented here is just last. So that's, uh, that's it for how we can uh, present it in this manner. Alternatively, what we could have done if we're presenting under IFRS is reverse the order of things. So if we look at the asset side, we can present in the reverse order of liquidity. So least liquid to most liquid. So starting with the equipment and then proceeding all the way through to cash. It's a bizarre way of looking at things from our perspective, but it's a, uh, a translation of what has been done in other countries under uh, IFRS. Then on the other side, in the liabilities and shareholders' equity, it's actually shareholders' equity that comes first, followed by the liabilities, and the liabilities in the reverse order due, so due later to sooner. So the non-current liabilities would come first of so the bank loan, and then accounts payable being the last item because it is due the soonest. Here are some key points to remember. First, Assets, of course, should be properly classified into current and non-current assets. And the order of presentation, of, as we have just seen, can be based on liquidity. So most liquid to least liquid, and that is applicable to both IFRS and ASPE. And it's the most common way of reporting, which is why it's still done. Alternatively, you can present in reverse order of liquidity. So least liquid to most liquid, and that's only under IFRS. In addition, liabilities should be properly classified into current and non-current liabilities, and the order of presentation can be based on when due, so we can elect soonest to latest or latest to soonest under IFRS. Next, if more than one type of shares are issued, so if you have common shares or preferred shares, or if there's any contributed surplus, and we'll see that in uh, tutorials later on, you must ensure that you have a subsection in the equity section that's titled contributed capital, or you can call that paid in capital. In addition, proper share disclosures 
on the balance sheet or in the notes of the financial statements are required and those should include the number of shares authorized and the number of shares issued and outstanding. Finally, some additional notework disclosures and reconciliations may be required depending on the complexity of the items being reported on the balance sheet. So this concludes tutorial six. We hope you found it useful.